Yeah. Oh, hi, and welcome to the first ever episode of Bibliophilia. My name is Becca Chavez, and I'm here with Scott Bergstrom, the author of The Cruelty. Hello, everyone. Um, Bibliophilia is a podcast and radio show about books, the people who write them, and the ideas that they contain. Our first episode is about Lolita, Vladimir Nabokov's most famous novel, probably his best novel, I would say. His classic and horrifying novel uh, that was originally published uh, in the United States, at least, in 1958. Yeah, but before that, it was in Paris because they couldn't, exactly. they couldn't publish it in the United States because it was too controversial. Um, it's actually kind of an interesting thing about that. Um, so he finished the book in 1953. It took him five years to write. He was originally going to publish it under a pseudonym, um, but then it was, uh, he finally sold it to a French publisher of uh, pornographic novels, and it was first published by this porno publishing house in 1955. And I know that was kind of a problem for him because he wrote an essay called On a Book Entitled Lolita, and he discusses like the difference between pornography and what he's written. And he's very clear that pornography is, let me see if I can find this quote, but um, pornography is about finding the titillating parts, essentially. Pornography is not about what's in between. And Lolita is very much about what's in between because there are really no, I mean, there's no real sex scenes in Lolita either. No, there's not, there's not any sex scenes, but there is a lot of psychological horror. And uh, I think one of the things that we need to uh, say right away is that this book has maybe the most cultural baggage of any book out there. Um, what were you uh, saying before, Becca? There was a quote from Lana Del Rey about Lolita. Yeah, I think Lana Del Rey, she actually has a whole... Um, album, which is kind of Lolita themed. And then she said that she reads it like once a year because she thinks it's such a great love story. And there's, a love it's story. just like, there's no way. Like if you're reading it once a year, there's no way that you could think this was a love I think, story. I have no idea. I'm not a big Lena Del Rey <laughs> fan. I mean, Sorry. the only way you could think this book was a love story is literally if you've never read the book. Yeah. Uh, I If this is a love story, then Friday the 13th is a movie about a misunderstood kid who's just <laughs> trying to make friends, you know. I but mean, it's, like, so common that people think this is – I mean, it, I also found it on a BuzzFeed list of books you should read if it's complicated this Valentine's Day. And one of them was Lolita. Like, there's – I mean, why would that be a book that you – it's not complicated. I guess it, it's uh, not complicated. I guess maybe you should – you know, it might be a helpful book if, you know, you are a 40-year-old male who is uh, continually raping a 12-year-old girl. <laughs> then I suppose that kind of complexity would be addressed in – that's, that's not complex. <laughs> that's not – that's very uh, – Yeah, well, <laughs> I would say it's a little bit uh, of a skeevy situation. Maybe maybe skeeviness, not complexity, is what <laughs> we should be shooting for there. So what's – um. So the general plot of Lolita, because it is such a misunderstood book and people are always saying like it's a love story. Not always. People who are misinformed are continuously saying that it's a love story. And there's this idea, I think, in the public view of Lolita as this – I mean, if you Google Lolita or if you look up Lolita on Pinterest or you can't Instagram hashtag it, they won't let you because it's that controversial. But um, if you look it up, what you find instead of – you know, stuff about Nabokov is pictures of tarted up girls right, attempting right. to look younger than they are. Right. And so uh, Lolita is somehow... It's got this John Bonet Ramsey kind of skeevy vibe to the whole, you know, like child beauty contest things to it. Uh, it so in case you're wondering at home, uh, if you're at work right now, do not Google Lolita. Yeah, <laughs> yeah definitely. Sure. You'll end up in Guantanamo Bay with a barcode <laughs> tattooed on your neck. Um, no, it's, uh, it's actually, you know, the interesting thing about the book and, you know, it's interesting that the, that the author Nabokov, you know, addresses this right away that he says, if you're, if you're reading this and he says this right in the beginning, if you're reading this to get, you know, salacious, uh, titillation and pornography, you're going to be very disappointed because there's not, uh, there's not any sort of descriptive sex scenes at all in the book. That said, uh, I find that it is... There are there's a lot of sexual acts that are implied and uh, they are horrifying to behold. Um, 
despite the controversial nature of the book and certainly of the subject matter, uh, it sort of became an instant uh, classic, though, didn't it, Becca? Yeah, and I think that's really rests on the strength of the language, right? Because it's it's not an easy book to read, which I think kind of lends itself to that idea that it is so titillating and it, it it kind of helps with the mystique because people aren't actually getting through it I don't think because it is yeah absolutely. It, it's difficult and I know even for my copy just about every other page I was writing down a definition of something that I had never heard of before yeah it definitely helps I you know I read it originally in college and it was not this was college in the mid 90s and I had a I think it was for a women's studies class that I read this so it was we shall say, not well received uh, by the professor. Um, that said, I so I reread it for the first time uh, in preparation for this uh, for this upcoming podcast of ours. And um, I read the uh, Amazon Kindle version, the annotated version, which was incredibly helpful because they had um, uh, lots of footnotes in there. So anytime that Humbert Humbert, who is the protagonist of, of the book, protagonist in air quotes there, uh, any time that he lapses into French or Italian or Spanish or German, which he does with some regularity, uh, there's a little footnote there to tell you, you just click on it and it tells you what it means or what he's alluding to, which is extremely helpful for sort of an ignoramus like me who doesn't speak. I know there's also an annotated version that you can get in print for, and I've seen it at like the Tatter cover of Barnes and Noble a couple of times that you can get a fully annotated version, just like right, you can right. with just about any other book. But you know, what's, what's interesting is that the whole theme of the book or, or, or the whole style in which it's written is that, well, first of all, it's one of these novels within a novel. Uh, it's supposed to be sort of Humbert's, Humbert's um, confession or autobiography published posthumously after, uh, after he dies. Did I get that right? Um, or while he's in prison it's awaiting supposed to- trial be published after Lolita dies. Right, which after is Lolita dies, but he's awaiting trial. Yeah, he's and, hoping... Oh, and, but he does die. He dies shortly before Lolita, I believe. Right, so. right. So the timeline's a little confusing. But in, in any case, the device is that it's set up within this framework so that he's... The words that you're reading are not Nabokov's words, so to speak. They're Humbert Humbert's words. And he is this incredibly erudite lofty intellectual, you know, a speaker of many different languages. He's a professor of literature. He's old world European. And he dri- he, he does a lot with wordplay and puns. And at times they're actually quite funny, like laugh out loud funny. Uh, but at other times he'll drift off into a foreign language. And it's part of a theme, I think, of general contempt that Humbert Humbert has for everyone that he, he really finds the rest of the world quite disgusting, everyone except for himself and yeah. Lolita. Yeah, and... Um, no one's up to his standards. Yeah, he's just... He thinks he's a lot better than he quite he right. is, is what I'm getting out of this. Now, the, I mean, you mentioned that he's an English professor, but we don't really... I mean, when he's describing his background, as he does in the beginning of the mm-hmm. book, he's he doesn't really explain much about his education or what his qualifications are for being this. I always just think of his his job as general academia because he's not really – he's like writing right. a book, in, correct? Yeah in, yeah, in theory, he's he's supposedly writing a book on comparative literature, comparing uh, French authors to British authors, you know. But but he never really seems to spend time on the book. He never really <laughs> does anything. He's too busy, uh, like, for, lusting after his – Right, his, his this, 12-year-old uh, – this 12-year-old girl who, in the second part of the book, becomes his stepdaughter, which is ugh, it, it's it's, horrible. Okay, so the general, I mean, the general plot of Lolita is that it, he does describe his background, and the background is that he fell in love with a girl when he was 13. Right. And because his excuse is that because this was ne- a love that was never realized, she dies of typhus, because it, it was never realized. Now he's always going to lust after this 13-year-old girl that he never got to really be with. Well, I think that's kind of an important point, because if the writer is, or if the reader is is reading Lolita and trying to do a little, uh, you know, psychological Sherlock Holmesing and trying to come up with psychological motivation. There's really not a lot to dig for. He's quite upfront about the whole thing and says, "Yeah, any psychologist uh, worth a damn will tell you exactly why I did this." Uh, and so his psychological motivation is never really a question in the book. Everyone gets it. Everyone knows it right off the bat, including him. Yeah. Okay. So. 
You know, I think it's I think it's interesting. So w when this book first came out in in French in 1955, uh, or rather by a French publisher in 1955, uh, it was actually forbidden to be. Um, actually, it came to the attention of Graham Greene, you know, the uh, British spy novelist. Uh -huh. And he wrote this newspaper column where he called it one of the best books of 1955. Um, but other people, and that kind of brought attention to the book, and the British government found out about it and said, and said that it was pornography and would seize every copy, uh, you know, coming into the country. So it was forbidden to import uh, any copies of of Lolita, and it didn't actually come out. Finally, in 1958, a, an American publisher picked it up, Putnam, uh, and it was an immediate bestseller right right out of the gate. It sold 100,000 copies in the first three weeks, which was the first time that had been done since Gone with the Wind came out. Yeah, but I mean, that's something that always happens when you tell people that they can't have something and then they can. I mean, like... Oh, precisely I, I, how I, apropos I, for this book. Yeah, I know that when... Ulysses came out and it was it was being published in the United States and, and it was a serious point of controversy because it was being published in a periodical and it could not be it could not go through the post office because we used to have these laws what, what were they called obscenity Those, laws or something like it, that but they had like a different name uh, anyway it's not I guess it's not that important what they were called but they a little they, fun they, fact for you do you know how obscenity laws were overturned in the U.S. Uh, for the vis a vis the, the postal service? I thought it had something to do with L Ulysses. Uh, no, it, well, uh, maybe it did, but. Comstock final, laws, right? Comstock mm, laws. Maybe. Uh, maybe that's what it is. Uh, okay. <laughs> I ain't no legal historian. <laughs> I'm just a writer of cheap thrillers. Uh, the No, it was actually Hugh Hefner, uh, of all people, oh. who got the final nail in the coffin of these you can't mail obscene materials laws when um, he founded Playboy and started sending out these subscriptions. And the Postal Service uh, stopped him. They said, you can't mail these, uh, this obscene literature. And he actually took them to court and won, you know. And uh, so just another okay. uh, another little cool thing about Mr. Hugh Hefner. But, but yeah, like with the book itself, I mean, the idea that something, it, it was coming to the United States. It, it's not like it wasn't, right, it wasn't in the it wasn't United States. It was getting, yeah. it was getting in through different, different means people were bringing it over and it was being passed around a lot by like one or two copies would be passed around a lot right. and I think it got that of course it's going to sell a lot if you're hearing about something that you couldn't have I mean the same thing happened with Lady Chatterley's Lover which right. I wouldn't argue is like an astounding book on any level but because it's got those n naughty bits in it like naughty that's bits. where it it really picks up steam and that's really what makes people want to read it more and, than controversy than the the book itself and i think that's true with lolita exactly and you know and keep in mind too that uh nabokov was already a very very highly regarded uh author and so here comes this guy of incredible literary stature you know uh say you know martin amos level uh of 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 literary merit and suddenly you find oh there's a there's a book that that we can't read of his because it's supposedly obscene of course you're going to read that of course it's going to be a bestseller um and uh, and my understanding is that the american publishers when he first tried to get it published in new york uh were quite reluctant to say sorry we we, we have to pass well this. in in this essay he wrote an essay which well i'll put it up on the facebook page for those who are interested but he wrote an essay and um he basically blames the the reason he basically blames these publishers for not reading the whole way through. They had an idea that it was going to be scandalous and pornographic, but it's it wasn't. It's it's not really a pornographic book because I think pornographic books really rely on those those bits that are like that are exciting. And this book isn't so much. And so he says, no, that everything book, is really implied. Yeah. There's no like titillating bits. It's not like a regular erotic novel. This right. is not 50 shades of gray, but with a younger woman standing. That's, in uh, I, right. Right. But I, but I want to point out too, that, you know, there's a lot of talk these days about trigger warnings in college classrooms, you know, for Oh yeah. People. And uh, so if you, uh, we should have maybe done this at the, <laughs> at the start of the <laughs> podcast. Uh, if you have uh, issues of um, molestation or whatever in your past, maybe you should turn the channel to something else right now. Uh, but this is, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's interesting because I actually think that this is not a book that could be published today for that very reason. Well, that I think that, I think that it's it. too psychologically distressing. That, you know, even as a, as a normal, well-adjusted adult human being, 
that to read this book now, if you have any kind of empathy in your body, you are horrified by what is taking place. It's really, it's definitely really disturbing to read. And I think one of the, the I mean, for me, like a lot of the problem comes from the fact that I feel like Humbert Humbert's lying. Humbert Humbert is the main character and he's narrating this. And I feel like he's lying and I feel that he's he's trying to cover up how disgusting it really is what he's doing. He's trying to make it sound like, no, this is totally normal. Are you saying that Humbert Humbert is an unreliable He's narrator? completely okay. unreliable. He's just a liar. He's oh, just a complete liar. I'm so <laughs> tired of that trope. See, I disagree on that. I, I do. I, I think that um, I understand why why a lot of people say that he's an unreliable narrator, but I disagree. I actually think he's quite frank about everything that he does. He just couches it in this sort of intellectual, polite language. Well, I think that's I, I think that's part of the lie. I think that's, I mean, if you're reading the book, one of the things you'll notice right away is that he's talking to an audience, but the audience is consistently changing. He's like, gentlemen and ladies of the jury, oh, prosecutors. He's Then he's addressing the prosecutors. Then he's addressing the nice women in America. America who are reading this at home and then he's addressing Lolita and then he's addressing the jury again and it's it's uh, these I and I feel like his language changes a bit depending on who he wants to gain sympathy from uh, yeah and absolutely I do think that in a way that's that's a definite lie that's a he's not telling the truth he's not he doesn't come out, like I said there's no titillating parts and and I'm not saying that there should be because obviously it's a novel about a man who repeatedly rapes a 12 year old girl but at the same time like he's not being honest with us about what he, he's trying to well, obscure but, that see I disagree I think he is being I, I think he's not only being honest with with the reader but I think he's even being honest with himself oh, he's uh, lying to himself no he's not lying yes. to himself he's just justified it though he's oh, just but, justified it in his head now, let me just give you an example let me just give you an example so I'm gonna I'm gonna read a quote okay. uh, from this and this is an absolutely horrifying disgusting quote and I was reading it uh, before the podcast started yeah. and Becca yeah. was she got shivers. Should I do it in my gross voice? In no, don't humber, do it in the gross voice. voice. Okay. Should just, I just do it in my just normal Just read it voice? like a normal okay. person because it's so pervy. It's so, so – this is um, something he says. Right. This is something that, that Humbert Humbert says to himself but also to the reader. Um, and, oh, we and, should put it in the context yes, of the what's context. happened. So, so what's happened is um, Humbert Humbert has come to the United States and he spends all this time in – mental institutions and then he gets out of one and he he's going to go work on the book that we mentioned before and he finds this house in new england where this woman ramsdale yeah um charlotte hayes is living with her young daughter and humbert humbert is attracted to the daughter who he calls lolita her name's actually dolores which is important i i think it's important that she be labeled correctly but he falls in love with dolores slash lolita and he's trying to figure out a way to be with her. And he's writing all these thoughts, these pervy, awful thoughts that he has about her in this journal. Well, Charlotte finds it eventually, freaks out, as one would. Of course, and and yeah. this is after they, they, oh, he marries Charlotte to get closer to Lolita. Right. So Charlotte finds out about, freaks out. She runs off. And it just so happens that when she runs off, she gets hit by a car, like, immediately. And, right, uh, right. Well, but but see, I, I even think that that's kind of an important idea. So there's all of these sort of, for Humbert Humbert, these happy coincidences, yes. as he calls them, that 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 happen. And and it reflects what I regard. And, and see, here we really get to this core of what makes this maybe the perfect modernist novel, which is, you know, one of the ideas in modernist literature, and by modernist, I mean 20th century literature from, say, James Joyce through anything written into the 1960s. And, it, and it's the relationship of human a human's mind to the world and whether or not our thoughts and ideas reflect actual reality, right? And in Humbert's case, it absolutely does not at all reflect reality. Um, and in fact, though, he seems to think um, that not only does it reflect reality, uh, but that reality conforms to the nature of his thoughts. And so by when, when Charlotte runs off across the street, for example, and gets hit by a car, he says, he, he gives some line in there about how this was very, um, 
it was very prescient on his part to have uh, have written this diary so that she could discover it, so that she could be horrified and run out across the street. What a genius he is for doing that. <laughs> and it's, you know, and it's absolutely terrible because he has no regard for anyone else in yeah. the world. And he doesn't even have regard for Lolita, who he holds as kind of an idea, I think. You know, it's yeah. the idea of the girl and the reality of her, of her tortured, awful existence is really ignored by him. And I uh, think throughout. that's, you know, I mean, okay, so after the Charlotte oh, yeah. gets killed, time. she he does take Lolita, and he does it in a very twisted way. And you're right, but he he takes her to this hotel and rapes her, and there's no pleasant way to say that. Because, there's, I mean, he keeps saying that it's not really... Lolita says it twice in the book. She says, you raped me. But he never says... He, he always tries to play it off like, oh... She wanted me. This is something that right, was supposed right. to happen. Yeah, exactly. This is fate. And so um, what happens is he t- he takes her on this cross-country trip because right, obviously he's... you cannot just sit in hotel rooms raping a person repeatedly. Someone's going to eventually get wise to that. Although that's you know. essentially what he does. He just does yeah. it in different locations. In different every locations day. every single day. But um, at one point during the trip, he says this quote that you're going to read. It, where he's He's... What, he's so he, he plots to take road. her across oh. to yeah I mean you know he's absolutely insane and he's a like I said he's a he's a horrible person as I was taking notes on this book I would I would write quotes in my little margin notes ninety percent of them are like gross disgusting horrifying you know things like that but here's a passage where he was going to take her across the border into Mexico for the purposes of having a child with her. And here's why. The thought that with patience and luck, I might have her produce eventually a nymphette with my blood in her exquisite veins, a Lolita II, who would be eight or nine around 1960, when I would still be dans le force de l'âge. Indeed, the telescopy of my mind, or unmind, was strong enough to distinguish in the remoteness of time a viard encore vert, or was it green rot, bizarre, tender, salivating Dr. Humbert, practicing on supremely lovely Lolita the third, the art of being a granddad. Oh, uh, I know. It's oh, and see, shiver like, But that's like what yeah. makes him so unreliable, that there's this complete disconnect between reality and what he's living. And I think that's... But he's I, telling you exactly what he's going to do. But he just he's, is, he's not even trying to justify it, really. He's just trying to... But I think that's because... So, I mean, like the whole thing being couched as this confession, I think the reason he's telling you this... He's not on trial for raping Lolita. We should make that very clear. Oh, right, right, right. But he's on trial for killing a man named Quilty. So he's kind of trying to use this, and I won't call it love. He's trying to confuse, he's trying to use this lust that he's confusing with love to justify the the killing. He's saying that he was, he's basically saying that he was so envious of Quilty, and Quilty was. Ma- such a terrible person that he had to kill Quilty because after Lolita finally leaves him, which takes a while because when you're 12, you have no resources to leave. Well, right. A and person. he explicitly threatens her. He says, Look, yeah. you know, if I go to prison, you're going to be an orphan and you're going to be a ward of the state and you're going to go off to some institution yourself where you'll be stuck with all sorts of. Uh, you know, gray halls and matrons, and and your life will be ruined if you if you tell anyone about it. Yeah, and that's uh, that's how the first the fir- it's broken into two books. The first book ends with her saying, "I have nowhere else to go." Right, and eventually she leaves to go be with Quilty. If you believe any of this, Quilty's such a weird character, but she goes to be with Quilty, and it, it, there's parts like at the end of the second, towards the end of the book. Humbert goes to visit Lolita Dolores at, um, she's married now. It's 16. She's married to some guy, a a veteran. And he goes to visit her and kind of asks her what she did afterwards. And she explains this this thing. She went off with Quilty and he was into some weird sex stuff. So Lolita left because every time children are taken... Yeah, something like that, yeah. or like an orgy. I think it was right. I thought. I thought. I, I thought it was a. I thought she made a a, a porno movie with with him. Oh, but, I got that sense. Maybe in I'm any wrong. case, it was anyway. something untoward. And, yeah, uh, <laughs> but apparently this was like so awful for Humbert. Like it's so terrible. 
he knows what he's doing is wrong, but right. he wants to kind of put that on other people. He wants to say that his feelings are justified, but the feelings of others are not justified. Well, I, I think that it's whatever exists in Humbert Humbert's mind is reality. That's his argument. And that if I am justified in doing this action, then then the whole world must be justified with me. You know, so here's an interesting idea that's, that's kind of related to this. You know, one of my favorite authors is Martin Amos, and he Sometimes he's brilliant and sometimes he goes off on these weird theories. And one of his theories about Nabokov and Lolita is that actually Lolita is an enormous metaphor for Stalinism or uh, totalitarianism in general, but is written from the tyrant's point of view. Now, Nabokov has said explicitly it is not a metaphor, which only, of course, excites uh, uh, Martin Amos more. Uh, but in any case... The idea is that if you think of it, nevertheless, it's sort of a helpful optic to, to look at the story, that if you have uh, Martin Amos um, saying, oh, it's a metaphor for Stalinism, it's a metaphor for tyranny, you know, that he's doing all of this stuff uh, because he wills it, because he wants to exercise his will on the world, that's actually kind of useful in terms of how Humbert, Humbert actually does act. He is a tyrant, and he does do this to other people regardless of the consequences. But he's... He's lying about, I mean, yeah, but I just feel like, like with any tyrant, they're going to be manipulative and they're going to figure out ways. It's not like Stalin was like, yeah, when I'm in power, I'm going to kill 23 million people. You know, it's, that's not something that's, he mm -hmm. has his little justifications for it. And I think that's too what he's, he, at no point does Stalin ever come out and say, yes, camps, let's kill him. Let's send him to Siberia. I want these people dead. What well, he he couches it in this language, and Humbert Humbert also does. Yes. But it's like, oh, but I had to do it because of this, or I was meant to do it because of this, and that's what makes him unreliable. That if he if he was being honest, he'd just be like, yes, I'm raping Lolita over and over again. Well, maybe the idea though is that what is reliability, what is truth, what is fact, is is really what we're debating here, because I think. And, and what an appropriate question to be debating when talking about a modernist mm -hmm. book, you know. Um, I, I take your point on that, and maybe technically it conforms to the definition of unreliable narrator. I still maintain, though, that he that he he knows that he's an awful human being by any objective standard. He just doesn't care. I I I think he. I don't know if he does. I mean. I have this feeling that he's like a sociopath, that, but he's like really bad at being a sociopath. Like he doesn't How care so? about other people. Like when uh, there's a scene where he's, co Charlotte confronts him. She found the journal yeah. and she confronts him. And um, he's like trying to play it off like really cool. He's like, oh no, honey, come into the kitchen and we'll have some drinks and chat this over. Like, like that's a reasonable <laughs> right, right. response to this. And he's, the way it's written, it just feels like he know, he's saying i knew i had to calm her down i knew i knew i had to like bring her back he knows he's being manipulative and i because he's trying to do it to charlotte what's he trying to do to us as the reader of this uh fair enough yeah i take your point on that but let's you know it's an interesting question that his um uh, that is humbert humbert technically a sociopath i think by modern definitions you definitely could say that he is and you know, one of the, the main reasons being his his utter and complete disregard for for other people. Yeah, you know, like you anybody. See, he just doesn't care about... Right. Not only that, but he holds them in, in, in deep, deep contempt, you know. Like, mm -hmm. for example, when Charlotte dies, you know, which is clearly his fault. You know, he, he frightened this, this woman. He ter terrified and horrified this woman. And she runs off and gets hit by a car immediately thereafter. It, and there's not one word about like, oh, man, I feel really bad about what happened, right? He acknowledges yeah. his responsibility for it, but he doesn't particularly care. And in fact, he sees it as actually a very useful mechanism for um, thereby I can get closer to Lolita. Yeah. And interestingly, and this I, I think brings up one of the major feminist critiques of, of Lolita, um, is that he also doesn't regard Lolita as a human being either. Oh, no, there, there's a couple not. of points where he where he alludes to the idea that she cries herself to sleep every night. You know, and he'll say something like, uh, she's still beautiful, even though her cheeks are red and puffy because she cries all the time. But I think that's part of the lie. I think that's part of because she is crying every night, but he's trying to keep saying that it's somehow she's somehow complicit. Like when 
and it starts at the very beginning. I mean, when he, the first night that he first rapes her, because that's what happens, yeah. um, he says, well, I'm sorry, actually, it's the morning that he he does it in the morning because he's sitting next to her all night long. And then in the morning, he says she initiated it. And I think, like, the, he says she initiated it, first of all, which is bullshit because as the adult, you're supposed to be like, no, no, of course. No. And then also he's like, oh, but she was so experienced. And like he's got this kind of victim blaming attitude. Like oh, indeed. it's her fault. But then when you read this description of her, and I'm going to try and find it. But um, when you read this description of her, like afterwards, she's sitting down in the um, lobby of the hotel. And the way he describes her. Is this the oh, one? Oh, go ahead. Here we go. Well, let me see. No, I'm going to have to. Is this the one where he has all the stats and figures on on her appearance? No. Um, Can I just bring that up real quick while you're looking for that? Oh, yeah. That, go so ahead. One of the, there's this passage in there where before Charlotte, which is Dolores' mother, uh, before she dies, he discovers this sort of journal that she keeps about her daughter's development. And in it, you know, all of these things are sort of measured her height, the, I mean, down to these minutiae, like the, the, the girth of her thighs, things like that. And so he has all of this information and he recites it to the reader, uh, you know, her height, her eye color, her, the thickness of her thighs. And then like the second or third to the last thing that he mentions is her IQ. And her IQ is 121, which is quite extraordinary, well, well, well above average. Meaning that, that Lolita or Dolores is, is not some, is not an idiot. She is not a dumb person. And yet her intelligence matters not at all to him. It's just a, another stat about her, her physical existence. So he doesn't try to nurture her mind in any way. He doesn't try to behave as any right thinking person would. To her, to, to him, she is just an, she's an object. She's a, she's a thing. And, and really more of an epistemological thing, like a, like a ghost that exists in his imagination, even though she's tragically real. Yeah. And he's ignores like the reality of what he's doing. What he's doing is psychologically destroying her. And she is really smart. And later in the book, you'll see that she's not performing well in school and she's, they do stop for a while and she goes to the school and she's not performing well. And she's just kind of destroyed this. I mean, she's never, she's, especially when she gets married and, and he meets her later, it's not like you're not seeing an, an intellectual person. You're not seeing someone who's using their mind to the fullest of their ability. And I think it's because she's so damaged in this way. And um, so I found the spots where oh, he's like, because he just, he does, he has a complete disregard for her. So he says that, you know, they, they copulated their relationship and, oh, it was just what he had always imagined right. it would be. And, and then he's describing her down at sitting in the lobby of the hotel. And he's saying that she has a, a purplish spot on her naked ne neck, a rosy rash around her swollen lips. I mean, that's of, that's the result of a, violent thing that he's completely ignoring the violence of this action and later she start she started complaining of pains she said she could not sit said i had torn something inside of her and like he just he's just like no we're gonna keep going yeah, it's 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 absolutely appalling I, oh the worst oh goodness and that's the worst one is when th it's after she's stopped at the school and they're moving again because he's trying to get away from quilty who's following them and the absolute worst one is that She's sick, and he takes her temperature, yeah. and she has a temperature of, like, 110, and then he, like, uh, he starts performing sexual acts on her, and he's like, but she wasn't really into it. like, <laughs> Right, right, right. And then at one I mean, point in the on. book, he accuses her of being frigid, you know? Yeah. Uh, as if, uh, anyway. Uh, there's there's one more quote. Can I just yeah, read it? Go just ahead. Getting down to the, the horror of it. Uh, so this is shortly after he... Um, rapes her for the first time in the hotel, which is called, the hotel is called The Enchanted Hunter. Uh, anyway, this is what he says. So uh, in my head, when I read this, uh, I hear the voice of Hannibal Lecter. Uh, so you do what you will. Uh, How sweet it was to bring that coffee to her and then deny it until she had done her morning duty. And I was such a thoughtful friend, such a passionate father, such a good pediatrician, attending to all the wants of my little auburn brunette's body. 
exclamation mark. Uh, my only grudge against nature was that I could not turn my Lolita inside out and apply voracious lips to her young matrix, her unknown heart, her nacreous liver, the sea grapes of her lungs, her comely twin kidneys. On especially tropical afternoons in the sticky closeness of the siesta, I liked the cool feel of armchair leather against my massive nakedness as I held her in my lap. There she would be, a typical kid picking her nose while engrossed in the lighter sections of a newspaper, as indifferent to my ecstasy as if it were something she had sat upon, a shoe, a doll, the handle of a tennis racket, and was too indolent to remove. Yeah, but she, oh. he's, yeah. And that comes Sorry. up again and again. I think that's something that comes up again and because even like the first thing that happens it, before he actually has sex with her, there's this scene where he's in the house and she's just hanging out on a chair and he happens to be on the chair, but he, right. he ends up getting off and yeah. she's just completely oblivious, which I think is um, an important point to bring up because in the, in like the pol collective public idea of what Lolita is. There's this idea that she's kind of tardy, I guess. Like this right. idea that she's and in some ways purposefully being sexual. Yes. And right. and Humbert himself blames her in the beginning. He's like, oh yeah, she she wanted it. Um and I think there's something to like as a child, she's twelve years old and she's right. going to be doing some things that are a little bit She's going to be testing out her sexuality in some ways. She's going to be seeing how far she can well, push maybe, it. Well, maybe, but so much and of what Humbert finds himself attracted to is just normal kid stuff. You know, yeah. like, a, like a girl sitting on a chair, uh, you know, cleaning her fingernails or reading yeah. a comic book or something. She's not purposely trying right, to attract. Right. She's trying to attract the paper boy, which is, right, comes right, up a few right, times. Exactly. She's and and Humbert, with the, Humbert is enraged by this. Yes, you know, she like, shouldn't be with the paper boy at no, all, God who's forbid. like the same age as her. Yeah. And that's just, that's not acceptable. Mm -hmm. But 40-year-old um, men, totally acceptable. And then... Technically, I think he's 38. Oh, ooh, well, that makes it better. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's kind of the issue, because he uses this teenage petulance in this way to, like, to justify a lot of what he does. And a lot of it, like, he talks about how Charlotte doesn't really care about Lolita, which is an obvious lie because she's trying, I mean, when she finds out what he's planning on doing, she's going to take her daughter as far away from him as humanly possible. But... Right. Well, you had remarked once. Uh, I, I want to go back to the sociopath okay. theme for a second. But you had regard. You said once uh, to me that he seems unable to control people the way other sociopaths would. What do you yeah. What do you mean by that? I mean, like, I think there's an idea of sociopaths. They're kind of charismatic and charming. And Humbert has this idea of himself that he's charismatic and charming. He, right. he repeatedly says he's got movie star looks, and Lolita's so lucky to be with him. Right. Like, <laughs> right. 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 Um, yeah. He's got this, but he's just. But I think the rest of the world sees him as he truly is, which is this 38-year-old man who's kind of pathetic and yeah. lecherous and who's obviously mentally unstable. Right. And, yeah, I, I think he's really bad. And every time I, I see him trying to control someone, it just doesn't work. It just – No, it, it doesn't work. And, I, you know, it's interesting that you that you have this idea too because, it, you know, you, you had said that he's unable to actively murder Charlotte. Yes. Right. You know, like there's a scene where they go to a beach, he and Charlotte, which is uh, Dolores' mom. They, they go to um, a beach and he, he has this fantasy. And he, in fact, he works out this perfect plan to drown her and he can't do it. He can't bring himself to do it. But it's not, he's not motivated yeah. out of, he doesn't not do it because he feels guilt towards it. It's just for some reason he feels um, inept, too incompetent, too uh, he's impotent. He's got a lot of issues. Impotent. Yeah. Like, and, and I think that's part of the reason that he's so attracted to nymphets is because nymphets, as he calls them, is because they're young and they can be easily controlled and Lolita especially can be easily manipulated. Well, even there, though, technically speaking, he fails because he has this whole plan worked out for when he gets her into the hotel to oh, drug yeah. her and then have sex with her while she's drugged and unconscious. But the drugs don't work. And instead, she's merely groggy and sleepy. And he writes about lying next to her and feeling the warmth from her body and like sort of moving a hand to touch her. But then in the end, he lacks 
uh, I hate to use this word, but he lacks the courage to do it. He just can't bring himself to do it. Because oh, I think he that's can't a lot. make the in my view, he can't make reality conform to his his wishes. Reality isn't quite as And that's quite why he's a bad sociopath. That's why he's right. so terrible at it. Because he's like, I'm going to behave this way and this is going to be the outcome. And it never really is. And, it, and I think, too, he has a first wife, not Charlotte. He he marries a woman before, a European woman. And she Valerie. leaves him. Yes. Yeah. And obviously this is a huge blow to him because he thinks he's such a... He's, I, he's so weird. I mean, he's... He's repulsed by Valerie and by Charlotte. As well, he's said. repulsed by everyone. He's repulsed by grown women. Well, yeah, but but everyone in general, like you know, he'll refer to you know just a normal person on the street as a baboon or you know something like that. He just has this naked contempt for everyone. Do you think it's like intellectual snobbery that it, he thinks I he's think so partly, much smarter? Yeah, than but he I is. mean, remember, in his mind, he's the only person that really exists in the world. You know, so that's how I see it, at least. But um, he's just. So, yeah, he's not a good sociopath. Um, you brought part up the before. reason that he's attracted to these children. Yeah, absolutely. Um, he's right that there is that immaturity there. Yeah, you had mentioned before. Um, you know, in our in our notes for the program, it was about uh, victim blaming, and oh, God, you yes. had you had seen a theme of racism throughout Lolita, didn't you? Well, I, it definitely comes out like right in the very beginning. I'm not going to say like the whole book is racist. It's very, it's very 1950s, I'll say. And I think right. this is because we're, okay, so one of the big issues that comes up with Lolita is what is the line between the art and the artist? Mm-hmm. And here's where I think we can definitely say beyond a shadow, it's, this is not what Nabokov thinks. And it's the... right. Uh, I guess, well, actually, I'm a little conflicted about it because um, after he gets out of the sanitarium one time, he goes in several times and never talks about what's happening in the sanitarium, why. Right. He's just like, generally, I was in the sanitarium. After he gets out one time, he gets a job with one of his doctor's brothers. So his doctor has a brother who's doing research on Inuit girls, and he goes up to Alaska do the research. Canada, yeah. yeah. And he talks about how those girls can never be nymphets. And it really doesn't – it doesn't sit well with me on, like, a, n- a number of levels. He he just talks about, like, how their features are not nymphet features. And it it does a number of things. First of all, it reinforces this Western ideal of beauty, which um, right. for a while there was something that I thought, like, that's Nabokov trying to put something on Humbert Humbert because – in, I mean, like in my world and in your, I don't think attraction is based on race. I mean, obviously there are some people who are more attractive right. than others in like certain ways, like chiseled cheekbones and well, nice abs. And, but, and, and one has one's own preferences. Yeah. Well. But I right. think that most people, like when they get to know a person, that kind of stuff kind of fades away. So it's a very, very yeah. racist view. And I thought at first I was thinking it would be easier for him because he obviously is looking for some kind of control and it would be easier for him to take a young child of color, like a young Inuit girl who everyone's like, Oh, they're an other. And we see this still today. Like I found, um, one website and I can't, it was like university of Minnesota. They were doing rape statistics that women of color are less likely to feel that they're being believed when they go in to, Mm. um, report a rape and they're less likely to feel that people will believe them like if they say because there's like like, and I hated that this book reinforced the idea that some people just weren't pretty enough to be raped in this way like it reinforces this way that like and and it's such a weird thing (laughs) to say that is a very weird thing to say (laughs) but I think that like it, it's it reinforces this idea that somehow gets stuck in the collective mind, and then you know when a, a sure. young woman of color goes into um, a police station, it's like, oh, I got raped. That's still lingering there. Well, I think that we would. So I don't, I don't find race to be a, a, a major or even really a minor theme in in oh, Lolita. No, I don't think it's. I like, mean, you, okay. I just found this very disturbing. Are, oh, true, and, and as well, you should. And um, I think that one of the things that, that like, at first I was, because like I said, at first this would be a sign, because Humbert Humbert would want to go after the most vulnerable. But then once I thought about it, like the Inuit girls at that time were probably surrounded by a very strong tribe. 
and they were surrounded by a lot of people. So it wasn't so much. I mean, they had a close knit family, which is something Lolita lacks. Her father's dead. Her mother ends up dying. And which she has nothing. Humbert explicitly yeah. looks for. He exploits yeah. that. And yeah. so I was thinking that might be it. So it would still fall in line. And then the line between the artist and the art is blurred once again. So, well, I, I, I happen to, I mean, this is a, a time when being a member of the KKK was about as remarkable as being a member of the Chamber of Commerce or something yeah. like that. You know, this is not, um, you know, there was definitely but I feel that's racial more... context. Yeah. I, that said, I, I think we would be remiss if we didn't bring up what I would regard as being much more overt, which is class uh, in, in, in this book, that he regards um, himself as being of this, of this cast, if you will, uh, that's that's higher than other people, including Lolita's family. You know, Lolita's mm. mother. He, uh, you know, her mother. It, it has to be said. Charlotte is is quite a sympathetic character in this. You know, she's a widow, or, or she's a widow. Um, you know, with a with a, a daughter about to enter her teenage years. She's um, she has sort of, I want to say. Uh, bourgeois pretensions you know she she likes to pretend to speak french to humbert yeah uh, she you know she's interested in she wants in, to travel in art in it she wants to travel you know and so here's a woman who's who's very much like any middle many middle class american women you know um especially of the 1950s it just was not available to her to, to travel or to experience the things that she wanted out of life and along comes this man humbert humbert who seems to represent all that she's wanted, all that she's missed, this true intellectual, you know, who speaks French and knows about art and literature, and she falls in love with him. And then she finds out that he's preying on her daughter. So it's, it, 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 But he, meanwhile, has nothing but contempt for her. Well, I think he has nothing but contempt for women in general. I mean, he true. describes women several times. He describes grown women several times in the book. He describes his first wife. Um, he describes Charlotte quite a bit. And then the, these co-eds he runs into oh, somewhere yes. and the every single time he's like they're so gross like he it, has it this just... line it, it says something about like that co-eds and we're we're talking about college age women here you know women yeah. you know 18 to 21 years of age hardly old by any standard and he says that they are uh like the tombs in which the the bodies of nymphets are buried you know it's just it, it's horrible he's yeah and so i think there's a repulsion on that. I wouldn't say it's a cast. I'd say when we're talking about the, he, he's definitely hating on like grown ups. <laughs> he does. Yeah, he hates on he doesn't, uh, women. He yeah. doesn't like grown ups in general. And they do kind of, in some ways, attack him, I guess, because they're always the ones who are the most skeptical of what's going on. Right. Like right. when he goes to, when they are staying at the house. He leaves all these clues that make it really obvious that he's hurting this person. And when they go to live in the house and um, she's going to school for a while, one of the neighbors says, you know, Lolita should come over to my house every once in a while at night. She shouldn't be there in your house. It's not acceptable for little girls to be trying to sleep while the radio is blasting at all hours of the night. And I just think... Yeah. I mean, he never says, oh, I used to play the radio so that it would drown out no, her screaming. No, people know what's going yeah, on. Yeah, people know kind of what's going on. Right. And she's, yeah. And that, I think the whole part where he's got her going to school is really like where you start to see the real damage that's happening. Oh, for sure. A lot of it. And it, it is that line with the neighbors. At one point, she brings over a friend of hers and, like, kind of offers the friend up. Right, right. As, like, somebody he could rape instead. Like, hey, this is someone you can... And the, the friend's kind of into it in that way that, like, you know, I, I think there are some girls that are just clueless and don't understand the true implications, which is how you get into these messes. And it, adults have to say no. Me adults specifically? Is that what you're <laughs> <meant? laughs> No, 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 no. But like this is this is how, how you end up into these sort of with problems. with situations yes. like this. And Agreed. Because, they, I mean, they just don't understand the, and then that's victim blamey. Like he he says that Lolita starts it, right? Which may or may not be true, but either way, as the grown up, you stop it because course, every yeah. young girl is going to do stuff like. Absolutely. Like that and some level. And I think that it, the, when the friend you, comes over, you know, and she's trying it out. And right, but, but remember, everything that you're reading about, that, that any sort of 
let, let's, for lack of a better term, let's call it provocation on the part yeah. of, of Dolores or her friend, right? Remember, he, this guy is a guy who sexualizes everything that these girls do. But he doesn't rape the friend. He doesn't rape the friend. Well, he hadn't yet. He just didn't have the opportunity. No, he to. totally had the opportunity. She's oh, like sitting I'm, there alone. I misread it then. Okay. Uh, but but he, yeah, so like uh, he... What, what I want to bring up real okay. quick, we're, we're getting near the end of our time here, and I, I want to bring this up because I think it's important, is that there is in no way any evidence that Nabokov was himself a pedophile. I don't uh, think he was. There, you know, nevertheless, let me just say this. I don't mean to impugn that good writer. However, when you read, let's say, a thriller, like a Tom Clancy book or mm-hmm. something like that, One is impressed by their technical knowledge of stuff that goes on. And you think, boy, they really did their research. I will tell you this. When you read this book, you have what you can only take to be the mind of quite an expert on this topic of what it's like to be a pedophile. And it is – that is what's horrifying. But I will say this, that I have met so many, especially young young women – who have read The Bell Jar and been like, this has a meaning for me. Like, you read books and you have... But I have never, ever once heard a pedophile be like, oh, if you really want to understand me, you've got to read Lolita. Like, (laughs) that's not something that happens on trial. Like, there's no guy who's been on trial and they're like, we're trying to understand how pedophiles work. And he's like, yeah, just read Lolita. Well, I don't know. I think, you know, uh, that this book might well be a cure for it because it is, I mean, it is so horrifying to read... The psychological descriptions of the horror that he that he puts her through and how very self he's just self centered his, his yeah. actions are. I think towards the end, like he does realize what he's done, which is yeah. why he goes to kill Quilty because right. he's he's finally like stuck with this realization and he wants to blame someone and he always consistently throughout the book blames other people. So he goes to blame Quilty and goes to kill Quilty and that's how he's in this mess. And so he's trying to, I mean, as the book goes on, like in the, in the beginning, he's like, Oh yeah, I'm totally going to rape this girl and I'm going to drug her and rape her. And then he's like, Oh, we're in love when clearly they're not in love. And then when she's gone, he's right. chasing her down. But it's like years after when he goes to see her as um, this married woman that he's finally like, oh, crap. I ruined a person. Like yeah. I had this person and I completely destroyed everything that was special in them and killed. And he wants to blame someone. Instead of blaming himself, he goes and blames Quilty. Which is, well, that's one of the the themes. uh, When I was reading about the analysis of this book and what other critics have to say about it, they point this out. So this isn't my original contribution to this thinking. But they say that there's this concept of the doppelganger, which comes up again and again in writers like Nabokov, Kafka, other writers uh, of the era, and it's the idea of a, of a doppelganger, which is, or, which is, say, a replica of oneself who is another person, right, who looks I, exactly the same, who acts in exactly the same way. And so there's this idea of him, it, when he goes after Quilty to kill him, that he's actually going after himself to, to, to kill himself, you know, yeah. as punishment for that. And I'm not saying one way or the other. I'm saying that theory is out there, and uh, it, it, it's not completely without merit. Yeah. And I must say, as far as pedophiles go quilty's pretty likable in this weird <laughs> I, I know that sounds awful but because first of all i'm not even sure if right. quilty was actually raping lolita right, I, because we I, can't trust we can't i can't trust, trust humbert so yeah. i i i think humbert wanted to blame someone and he blamed quilty but quilty could have been just rescuing her but he's he's actually i mean even when he's dying there's this even when he's dying, he's like making little jokes and he's running ar- around the house and playing the piano and Humbert's repeatedly shooting him and he's like, ha you're killing me <laughs> right, now. Right. Well, again, <laughs> well, again, this goes back to his complete impotence as a, as a, as an actor in the, in the objective world that's out there, you know, uh, yeah. that, that, you know, just as he couldn't kill Charlotte, just as he couldn't sleep with Lolita without drugging her, he can't kill Quilty either. You know, he's just this incompetent, fey dilettante intellectual fop that can't do anything uh that can't do anything right yeah you know um even though he thinks he's the greatest thing since sliced bread so uh i think we're reaching the we do and i want to say 
one more thing, because there's one line in Lolita that I think kind of sums up a lot of it. I'm going to let you read this up. one. <laughs> and this is what he says to the, he's talking to the audience. Imagine me. I shall not exist if you do not imagine me. And I think that's really it. Like exactly. you, you can't, you can't, I think that's, that's something that separates Nabokov from Humbert Humbert. He's, he's saying that we have to imagine this horror that exists within all of us. And most of us mm -hmm. don't, obviously aren't going to explore it to the depth that Nabokov, but it exists out there. And maybe there's a part of it that like kind of exists in all of us, but the rest of us are like, that's ridiculous and that's absurd, but but he's letting it live, like Humbert's like just feeding this perversion. Well, maybe it's that, or maybe it's this idea that you're not going to get my side of the story. All you're going to see are these plain, boring old facts, you know, and you're not yeah. going to get my side of the story unless you imagine it. I, uh, I have to say, I, I, you know, one of the concluding things I want to say about this is that, you know, as much as I've kind of, beaten the grossness of, of this book or many of the passages to death, it is a tremendously beautifully written book. It is and great. The, the language and, and, and not knowing what's true and not true. And sometimes, as I said before, it is actually laugh out loud funny. And that's what's horrifying about it. I think, yeah, I think it's a book that I want to reread, but I don't want to reread it. Like, I don't want to go through the emotional toil of rereading it, but I want to read the language again. And I want to read uh, the way he puts things together. And Nabokov said, in this little excuse that he has for it, which is so great, he says, my private tragedy, which cannot and indeed should not be anybody's concern, is that I had to abandon my natural idiom, my untrammeled, rich, and infinitely docile Russian tongue for a second-rate brand of English, devoid of any of these apparatuses, the baffling mirror, the black velvet backdrop, the implied association and traditions, which the native illusionist, frack tails flying, can magically use to transcend the heritage in his own way. But he did it. I mean, he did that. That's oh, what absolutely. he did. He transcended absolutely. the heritage, and he created... Uh, Probably one of the greatest novels ever written for oh, in the English. Absolutely. Language. Well, uh, anyway. maybe of any language, yeah. you know. But I mean, here we have a guy who was the master of being a novelist in two languages, two languages which are absolute opposites of each other. So I mean, it's a huge, huge accomplishment, and he really seems to relish the the deliciousness of the English languages uh, in in ways that, as a writer, I appreciate it, and as and as a reader, I think so many people can just delight if you if you love reading literature, not just for the story, although certainly there is that in Lolita, but if you love reading it for the love of language and, and wordplay, this book is absolutely a must read. That said, I wouldn't, I think it's a mistake to teach it in colleges. Uh. I just, I don't think that people can understand it at that age, as I didn't. Mm. All right, speaking of books that are beautiful to read oh. and also have a plot, uh, next week we are going to be talking about Les Miserables, which is apparently beautiful to read in French. <laughs> Let's just Les get that Les Miserables. If you're going to be French about it, that's how you have um, to say it. The I, Miserables? I gonna, the Miserables? The, the miserable ones. The miserable yeah, people. It's but an idiom. We're okay. talking about that next week. I'll be back. Scott will be back here next week. And then the week after that, we're talking about The Monk by Matthew Lewis. And there will be somebody else here. Not you. My Kiyomi is coming. And um, so... Just so everyone knows, they can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash bibliophilia podcast. You can find us on Libsyn at bibliophilia. We're trying to get on iTunes. And if you want to contact us about anything at all, if you want to sponsor us, if you want to just tell us we're awesome, if you want to tell us we're terrible, you can write to us at bibliophilia podcast. If you want to know where you can get my novel, The Cruelty. Oh, yeah. If you want to know where you can get Scott's novel, The Cruelty. Here's a hit. Bookstores everywhere. <laughs> um, you can find all that. You can just ask general questions, general inquiries. Go to bibliophiliapodcast at gmail.com and we'll get back to you because I don't feel like that's the first time. It's probably not going to be people banging down the door. I'm not, I don't expect to get emails I don't know, but maybe, maybe that this is going to be an overnight sensation <laughs> because of the insightful nature of our literary criticism. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, I'm sure that's... What, so, Les Miserables next time, obviously, with just a week to read this book, <laughs> <laughs> you'll want to get started right away. <laughs> right. Uh, here's a hint. There's a really good movie version. Yeah.
Eddie Redmayne's in it. He just won an Oscar. You should go <laughs> read that instead and or watch that. the guy from that. Gladiator sings horribly. Yeah. And Wolverine doesn't have his claws. <laughs> He's still awesome in it, though. Yeah. And the dumb girl from Mean Girls. It's, so. a great, it's a great movie. Uh, it's okay to cheat on this one because yeah. the novel is like the size of a Los Angeles phone book. <laughs> so, uh, and we'll talk a bit about what's making the novel so long and what's so great about the book next time. And also so, what's not so great about what's it. What's not so great about it. So thank you so much for tuning in to our first episode of Bibliophilia. We will be back next week and hopefully you will as well. Thank you very much, guys. Bye.